Hello and welcome to week seven of the Genomics in the Cloud Book Club. I'm your host, KT Picard. In today's meeting, we'll be covering chapter six, GATK practices for germline short variant calling. Uh, we'll go over the additional resources and as usual, have our open discussion. Uh, this really gets us into uh, the heavy lifting of the book. Uh, this is probably one of the most challenging chapters in chapter six and, and also chapter seven. But this week, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our third guest speaker. Uh, we now, as I say, enter the, what I call the, you know, the heavy lifting or, or most challenging part, uh, germline analysis. Today, we're honored to have someone whose practical experience with bioinformatics uh, can guide us through this complicated topic. For the past seven years, our speaker has been with the University of Michigan, where he works in Michigan Medicine's Clinical Genetics Laboratory on next generation sequencing pipelines. He's been using bioinformatics techniques for over a decade to improve human health. He holds a master's from bioinformatics from the Georgia Institute of Technology. His call bars repository on GitHub is based on GAT best practices and he's using GATK version 4.1.9 for germline variant detection making him a really ideal present presenter for uh, this week's meeting. I uh, hope he'll, he'll be able to uh, sequence his own genome soon and find the sweet tooth gene that we both share in common. Uh, please welcome Amit Rupani. Hey, thank, thank you for that very uh, nice introduction. Uh, certainly got the smile on my face that I need for my first recorded presentation. Uh, However, I do have to mention the call bar repository, repositories for a uh, single sample. And what we are going to be talking about today is uh, joint analysis, but maybe we can touch base on that a little bit uh, in Q&A. So I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. And again, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. All right. Uh, can, can you see my screen fine? Yes, yeah, looks great. All right. Uh, before we dive into the best practices for germline variants, um let's quickly recap uh, what are germline uh, what germline variants are as opposed to somatic variants so germline variants are basically variants that are inherited from your parents to you and then you in turn inherit them to your children so these are the variants basically that you are born with and uh, germline variants are present in every single cell of your body Whereas uh, somatic alterations are highly tissue specific and uh, uh, it can happen anytime during uh, your lifetime as early as in embryo development. Uh, so uh, not all the germline and somatic variants are uh, disease associated. However, the challenging part as bioinformaticians is to find those that are associated with diseases and uh, see how uh, we can use that information to uh, improve patient health. All right. So one of the things I like about the book is uh, that in addition to helping you get started with doing genomics in the cloud, it also helps you understand how to use uh, GATK, that genome analysis toolkit, how to use GATK in the best way possible to find uh, germline and somatic variants. So the slide you see here is an overview of the best practices for the germline variant detection. Uh, we will look complicated, but we'll touch uh, base on uh, every section here and hopefully by end of the presentation, everyone feels comfortable with uh, the best practices. That's the idea. Uh, so the, we'll start, I'll start talking about uh, data pre-processing. Uh, then we'll have a hands-on exercise on uh, joint uh, variant discovery, and later Katie will take over for uh, variant filtration. 
So uh, data processing involves three major steps. Uh, the first one being mapping the sequencing read to reference genome. The second one is marking duplicates, and the third one being uh, base quality for recalibration. So what we get from sequencing machines is uh, lots and lots of reads. That, that sequencing reads, uh, let's say if we are doing 30x whole human genome sequencing on an Illumina platform, uh, we can expect to see 360 million reads. And these reads are stored in files for less fast Q files. Note that there is no positional information associated with reads in fast Q files, meaning we don't know where exactly the read comes from in the genome. So uh, that makes it necessary for us to map these reads in the FASTQ files to the genome in order to find that positional information. Another format in which the sequencing reads can be stored is UBAM. And uh, this format is predominantly used at Broad Institute uh, because this gives an added advantage of uh, appending the uh, appending the metadata like uh, read groups along with uh, the sequence. So read groups are basically tags that will help you uh, distinguish data from different individuals. And uh, data processing workflow is designed to operate independently on data from each individual sample. So it's better to have, uh, it's better to use these read groups uh, in the data to come up with uh, uh, the, to come up with data for each individual sample and do the analysis independently for each individual sample. So we begin with mapping the, these millions and millions of sequencing reads to the reference genome. And there are, uh, it's computationally very intensive and there are several mapping tools out there to do this job. Uh, nautically, you can use any mapping algorithm as long as you're able to find good results and uh, find compatibility with downstream uh, tools that you would be using. However, GATK development team recommends that uh, you use uh, the, uh, the MEMS utility of Boo's Wheeler Aligner algorithm in order for your data to be compatible with cross analysis with other data sets. So I have uh, mentioned the command uh, here for mapping the read to the reference genome. Uh, so the BWA mem, the dash T option that you see here is basically telling the BWA mem to use uh, seven threads. Uh, this, we need, so we, base, we are basically leveraging that option uh, to parallelize the process and uh, uh, really gain some, uh, save some time of analysis by parallelizing the process because Every Indian, every individual really needs to find the home in the human genome. And this will uh, really accelerate the analysis. Uh, talking about acceleration, an updated version of BWMM uh, was out uh, called BWMM2. It's uh, around two to three X uh, faster than BWMM. Uh, I have used BWMM locally and I have experienced the speed like speed gains of about 1.5x. Uh, however, it was not uh, very well designed to scale locally, so I had to move back to uh, BWMM. But if you are using computationally advanced infrastructure like high-performance computing machines, uh, on uh, like high-performance computing machines or, uh, or Google Cloud Platform, uh, you can really leverage uh, those tools and the DASTI option to speed up uh, the process of mapping the reach to the reference genome. So the file we get from BWMM is a SAM file, which is sequence alignment map file. This file will contain reads with their positional information. And uh, this SAM file can further be compressed uh, to a BAM file using sample view utility. All right. Second step in the process is marking duplicates. Uh, duplicates are basically reads that come from uh, same DNA fragment in the DNA library. Uh, duplicates uh, arise because it duplicate uh, duplicate arise because it can occur during uh, the library preparation if it involves PCR amplification. However, recent techniques, uh, PCR amplification methods 
are uh, becoming unnecessary and uh, in order to avoid these technical errors. Uh, also, there can be duplicates uh, in the data due to optical confusion, confusion by the sequencer when it reads a single DNA cluster on the flow cell uh, as two identical, two isolated clusters generating, uh, generating the same read twice. So the, the tool we can use to mark duplicates is the mark duplicate uh, tool in uh, genome analysis toolkit. And uh, what you see in the slide here is a bunch of reads. Uh, and if you see a cross mark uh, against that read, that read will not be marked as duplicate. And if you see a check mark uh, against the read, uh, that will be marked as duplicate. And let's uh, go over uh, quickly. Uh, Let's skim through uh, these reads and why would they not be marked? Why would they be marked as duplicate? So the first read here is uh, won't be marked as duplicate because it's the first read, uh, and the second read has lots of mismatches and indels, and it could give us important information about uh, uh, short uh, variants, like heterozygous short variants in that region, and therefore that will not be marked as duplicate. The third read uh, goes longer into the fragment and gives us information about more bases. So for that reason, it will not be marked as duplicate. However, DAT has this amazing ability to extract information from soft details and align them to uh, reads that are already aligned and mark them uh, duplicates if it finds a perfect alignment. And as you can see, the SS soft field bases can there is high likelihood that the SS in soft field bases corresponds to TA and it perfectly aligns with the read we have seen and that will be marked as duplicate. The last read is basically the first read reappearing again and therefore it will be marked as duplicate. So I have to share a personal experience here. Uh, when I have run the mass duplicate tool, I have often come across errors with respect to read groups. Uh, mass duplicate tool requires you to have a read group present in the BAM file. So, uh, so there is a different tool called as add or replace uh, read group uh, in GAPK, which you can use to add uh, the read group so that you don't run into errors while you are using uh, Mark duplicate tool. So this slide is showing IGV screenshots from the BAM file that did not have duplicate uh, marks, which is on the left, and uh, on the right, the BAM uh, the BAM file has the duplicate marks, and uh, some of the downstream tools have ability to auto detect. Uh, uh, to automatically hide, uh, to, to automatically hide duplicates, and IGV uh, does that uh, for you by default. So we are on to perhaps the very controversial uh, section of the best practices, that is base quality score uh, recalibration. Uh, I'm going to try my best to cover what's in the book, and maybe in Q and A uh, we can discuss more. So. Base qualities are very important. Uh, they play a very important role in variant calling. In weighing the evidence uh, of a site, can be a variant site or not. So, uh, so these qualities uh, ideally should not have any bias in them. However, there are sequencing. Uh, however, there are systematic biases uh, which uh, creep into the data. Uh, and these systematic biases are due to the biological processes involved in library preparation and sequencing, or it could be due to manufacturing defects in flow cells and the instrument itself. So we want to make sure that we are correcting uh, these biases. So the plot that you, the central plot that you see is the reported quality uh, plotted against the empirical quality. Uh, the, uh, the, the pink dots are basically uh, qualities of the bases. Uh, before doing the base quality score recalibration, and uh, the blue dots are the quality for the bases after doing the base quality score re recalibration, and the diagonal line is uh, optimally where we expect to see the dots. So as we can see, uh, the pink dots have uh, are are 
most of the pin dots are below the diagonal line. It means that the base qualities were overestimated uh, by the it, it, base qualities were overestimated by the sequencing machine. So if we consider the pin dot to the extreme right, we can see that the base the sequencing the sequencer reported the quality of that pin dot as somewhere around 40. However, we see that. However, if we see the empirical quality for the same dot, it, it is somewhere around 30. So that needs to be corrected. Oh. And uh, and this quality score recalibration uh, will help you make these corrections. The plot on the right is in the dinucleotide context and it's pl plotting the errors for the dinucleotide errors in base quality uh, for dinucleotide. So the pink. Uh, Pink horizontal bars uh, are the base qualities before performing the base quality score recalibration, and you can see that the errors are that uh, there's a lot of noise in uh, in in that. And uh, after we perform the base quality score recalibration, we see that the errors uh, basically converge to uh, zero, and that's what we optimally want for our data. Uh, also, even also, one thing to point out here is a lot of uh, these uh, pink bars are below uh, the value of zero, which again means that uh, the sequencing machine overestimated the quality of these bases, these bases, and base quality for recalibration to uh, recalibrate the quality to what they are supposed to be. So there are two different tools, uh, base recalibrator and apply base quality score recalibration uh, in GATK, uh, which can be used to perform uh, base quality score recalibration. And this is basically a machine learning uh, method that will create a recalibration models or tables, and these tables can be used by apply base VQSR tool to correct uh, the base quality uh, in, in the basis. All right, that was all about the pre-processing. Uh, there is uh, no hands-on exercise for pre-processing because the idea I get from the book is that a um, lot of sequencing service providers are integrating uh, the data pre-processing steps as uh, part of their services, and we get the analysis ready then uh, so we don't have to worry too much about data pre-processing. Uh, once we have the analysis ready bank files, uh, what we do is joint variant discovery. So before we move on to the hands-on exercise for joint variant discovery, I just want to tell this on why to do giant, joint variant discovery. Why not just work on one single sample? So the simple answer to that is a uh, single sample will not give us uh, enough information. Uh, if there are multiple samples you are working with, uh, the variant caller is more confident to call variants in those regions. So let's say if we were to work only on sample one, we see that the coverage is poor in that region, and there are only two reads uh, that that has a uh, variant from A to G. However, these variants could very well be uh, uh, the could very well be the library preparation or sequencing artifact, and uh, if they have a lower base quality. Uh, they could easily get eliminated in the tertiary analysis, which is a uh, variant filtering process. Uh, but when we are, when we do the joint analysis, we see those same variants uh, occur again in sample number two. So variant caller will assign high confidence uh, to these variants, and uh, uh, these variants won't get filtered out in uh, the tertiary analysis process. So, uh, so basically, that helps the variant caller assign high confidence uh, to the variants while calling variants. Also, when you're working with single sample, you run the risk of not calling the variants. As you can see in the pile up in the right, uh, there are two predictors for Alzheimer's disease, and you see uh, pile up on the top, and we don't see any variants. There is good enough data, uh, and it's OK to not get called there. However, uh, in, in the below sample, there is not enough data. And if we miss those clinically important variants, it can be clinically disastrous for the patients and uh, 
and uh, joint genotyping basically uh, solves this problem because all it needs is a variant at in one sample to make the corresponding calls in locations in all the samples. Uh, I do have my own uh, concerns with respect to that, but maybe we can uh, talk about that in uh, Q and A. So let's get to the fun part: the hands-on exercise. So for the hands-on exercise, we will be working on a cohort of three samples, uh, mom, dad, and uh, the uh, son, uh, which can be considered as a proband uh, with a phenotype, with a disease phenotype. Uh, and we begin by, by, by using haplotype caller uh, to, we begin by using haplotype caller uh, in TBCF mode, and I will uh, explain what that means. Uh, but haplotype color was uh, very beautifully covered in uh, previous week uh, Genome in the Cloud Book Club meeting by Mikhail. I highly recommend you check that out. We'll be using the same command. The only thing that will change is uh, we'll add dash ERT TBCF. Also, uh, we are providing the reference. We are providing the BAM file that needed to go for uh, for running the haplotype caller in GDCF mode, we'll provide the output file that we get and the intervals for within which the haplotype caller is uh, running. So that ER to GDCF basically tells haplotype caller to run in GDCF mode, and uh, I'll show you what that means. Take this and run it. So I'm already in the Docker container. If, uh, if you are following the uh, hands-on exercise, uh, make sure you use the first command in the uh, in the sheet that I had uh, sent, uh, and then uh, you can use this command. All right. So here we are running haplotype folder in GVCF mode. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. So GVCF basically stands for genomic VCF, and let's see the v and let's see what we get inside the GVCF. So what we see here is uh, information for every single base in the genome, and hence the name GVCF. Uh, whereas VCF will only have the variant. Uh, region. So, as you can see here, uh, this is starting at 10 million position, and uh, it's ending at 10 million and 8 position. And uh, this does not have a variant in it, and that's why it says uh, non-reference. So, you see records for every single uh, base in the genome in uh, in GVCF file, and that's what separates it from. Uh, this, that's what separates uh, is from a VCF file. This will only have records uh, for the variant. If you if you do scroll down, you will see regions that are variants as well. So you see a uh, heterozygous. T to T change here, uh, and yeah. So basically, both uh, variant as well as non-variant sites are reported in GVCF. So we just ran the GV. Uh, we just ran haplotype caller in GVCF mode in mom for mom's data. Uh, let's do the same for dad's data.
All right, we have the GVCS form that that data, and let's take a look at that. All right, so we get the GVCS for that data now, and uh, we see the genotype for. Sorry, this is a uh, mom. This is supposed to be mom. Uh, no, that 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 data. Yep. So we we see the genotype calls for the that uh, sample here, and uh, we see that every single uh, base in the in that particular interval is uh, is part of this GVCS. You were getting some warnings there in the output. Are those important? Uh, what warnings? Like, um, oh, like I, I don't know. They, maybe it's just trivial stuff, but it just looks like you have a bunch of warnings in your uh, in the log there, up at the top. Warn. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, look into that, but uh, I'm pretty sure it ran it ran successfully right now. Oh, uh, there can be warnings when you're running a GATK tool. Uh, yeah, and it's it's good to uh, look back on what it means and uh, correct them. Uh, but for now, I'm pretty sure it ran successfully. And I will look into what those warnings are later. I'm not able to find actually. I, I can't I can't see the warnings. Okay, right here, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to dig into more details on that. So we have the GVCS ready for mom and dad data. Uh, what we do now is we are assuming that we don't have sons data because a uh, lot of times in population genetic studies, you're working with thousands of samples together and you don't always have all the data available. So uh, it would be nice to work with what data you have available. So we would be using these GVCS uh, from mom and dad data uh, to create a genomic DB database. So we did successfully make the database, uh, I guess. So let's look at the database. So yes, there is uh, the database that successfully created using both moms and dads uh, GVCF. So now how do we extract uh, the variance from these database if we need to look at the data, if we need to look at the combined uh, or consolidated data from mom and dad. So we'll use select variance tool uh, from GATK to extract the variance from these database. We'll supply the reference file, we'll uh, supply the location to the database, and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll export uh, the variance in, in a G.VCF file. So let's see how the consolidated uh, uh, file, consolidated VCF looks like. So you see that the consolidated uh, VCF has data from both uh, mom as well as dad, and it, ha it will have the genotype uh, values for each look, each uh, position in the genome for both mom and dad. And this is how the consolidated variant looks like. So now let's assume the sun's data becomes available, and we need we need to create a GVCF file for the sun's data and then update the already existing uh, genomic database we created using the uh, GVCF file of sun's data. So you just create a GVCF file for sun's data.
So now we will add the sun uh, sun's data to the combined uh, data to, and we'll update the genomic DB database. Uh, and the tool for updating the genomic database will be genomic DB import. We'll provide the sun's GVCF and update the genomic DB database with the sun's GVCF. Now we'll extract the combined data for mom, dad, as well as son, and we'll take a look at the VCS after extracting the combined data. We'll uh, we'll go back to using select variance tool for uh, from GATK to extract the data from mom, dad, and son from the database. I see some warning here as well. I think it will be interesting to dive deep into those warnings. So this is so here is the extracted data from uh, mom, dad, as well as uh, the son, and we see genotype values here for all three samples. Uh, that that's the extracted data from the database. So now we have the uh, database ready with all the samples uh, and uh, uh, we can run genotype GVTS on these uh, GVTS to generate a VTF file which will only have the variant. Uh, and the command and the tool for that would be genotype GVCF will supply the reference file, will provide a location to the database and an output we and the final output VCF that it will generate and uh, and the interval in which we are working. All right, let it run successfully. So let's look at the final VCF. All right, so we see here that this VCF file has a variant, has only variant location as opposed to every single location in the genome. And, and it, it has this variant location, variant information uh, for uh, all the three samples. So uh, in the review process, uh, we can uh, come back to this file and review uh, the variance in, in all the three samples together. Uh, and if you are working on thousands of samples, that's how uh, the VCF will work out. You will have all the addi additional samples here. The beauty of this process is it really solves the N1, N plus one problem because you can update uh, you can update the database whenever the samples become available, and uh, and you can uh, run genotype GVCF to call the variants on uh, on the cohort. So, so we use so. To summarize, we use the analysis ready bank for mom, dad, and uh, son. We we ran the haplotype caller in GVCF mode uh, for all the three cases in order to create a genomic DB database, which will be a consolidated cohort. We used the genomic DB database and ran genotype GVCF on the consolidated cohort to give us a final VCF file, which will only have records for variant locations. And this process, like I said, is uh, is very flexible. If you have new samples coming in, you can add to the genomic DB database and run genotype GVCF again, and it scales linearly. And that's all from my end.
I mean, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate your walking us through. That's kind of the, the secret sauce of, of GATK. And uh, I'll pick it up from here. So uh, I mean, watch us through the first two parts. Uh, you can see on the map that where we are in this process, having gone through pre-processing and joint variant discovery, we're now at the, the filtering and refining of, of, of genotypes. Uh, I'll walk through a couple different examples that are in the book. Um, and this now gets into some of the machine learning aspects of GATK. Um, through filtering, uh, this is using a, uh, a commonly used uh, cluster analysis process. And what we're trying to do now is look for um, variants that are commonly found and using machine learning then to uh, do further uh, filtering based on these clusters. So what you're looking at on the left is a machine learning model that was trained on the HapMap database, and that's all the, the dots in red. Uh, there are two uh, circles, the ovals there. The first one is um, the ones that uh, are, are going to be called true, and the second oval is the ones that will be called false. So um, this, these circles represent uh, a Gaussian distribution. It, it might be easiest to think about the, uh, the circles as a, a, a Gaussian cone coming actually out of the screen, and you'll see them in the next uh, slide as we uh, as we lay the, as we lay these out. The the axes in this diagram are the read depth across uh, across the bottom, and then uh, a log scale of uh, quality across uh, on on the on the left uh, on the vertical axis. So we train it, and in, as we do so often in in, in neural network models, um, we train it on one model. Whoops, come on. Uh, and then we apply it to another. So you can see on the right how it's applied to novel SNPs. Uh, and then you can see the same circles that are that are applied. So um, the things that are in the, in the green circles are applied. The other ones are rejected. And then these, uh, the purple ones, for example, are just clipped uh, as, as, as being filtered out as likely error. So a little bit more about um, how we get to this variant quality score or VQS. Um, we, quali we, we calculate the, uh, the, the log uh, of, of the scale, the log odds ratio, or uh, LOD. So the VS, VQSL LOD is, is the, <laughs> the mouthful there. Um, and you can see what we're trying to do here is, um, now we have the two Gaussian curves, uh, the, the P curve on the, on the left representing the good variants, and the, the Q curve um, representing the, the negative variants. And the trick always with cluster analysis is trying to figure out the, the, uh, the point at which that you call things as good. And in GATK, the best practice is to recommend a selection of a selection point of 99.9% .9 of the area of the, under the good curve. And so that's what you're seeing here is that uh, in the, the, the models, that, um, there's a crossover point where you have uh, a log of the two errors and again, picking, picking a spot. So as we look at um, the, the code itself, this is one of the longer pieces of code. Uh, in the interest of time, we won't be running this, but uh, it's a variant recalibration. Then you can see the inputs uh, into this. There's then a bunch of resources, and these then are the trained neural net models. Uh, they're showing you that uh, they're a training set. Um, one of them is known to be true, and the other ones are uh, other, other inputs into the process. At the end, uh, it gives you an output then that you can apply. And here's the important bit is this, uh, the truth sensitivity filter. And as I mentioned, the best practice then uh, of 99.9%. .9%. At the end of the day, you end up with uh, joint calls that are filtered um, using the neural net model um, that was provided. So that's one, another way of getting uh, the filtering and, and annotations together through, through um, BQSR. There's a final step um, mentioned in best practices in the book uh, using uh, genotype posteriors. Um, this is in the, when you're doing, uh, for example, trio sequencing and you have information, uh, for example, in this case, there's the trio pedigree that explains the difference or the relationship between the mom, dad, and the proband. Uh, and then again, uh, other supporting call sets that you'd like to use, in this case, the nomad set, um, it allows you to further refine uh, genotypes based on this, uh, this posterior alignment. Um, so it's, again, another optional step in, uh, in best practices. 
And as you can see here, uh, it, what it did in this case was the father had a, a high quality genotype. Once it had gone through this process, uh, the, it had been adjusted and it went from 42 in the original down to a quality of two, so it was removed. Uh, so the call was changed based on uh, the additional information that was provided by uh, these large data sets that provide um, you know, additional quality information that you can add to uh, your column. The other part that I wanted to talk about was um, a, a, another method for doing single sample workflow, and uh, it's using convolutional neural nets. Um, let me make sure everybody's muted. There we go. Okay. So um, the second part was uh, using uh, convolutional neural nets, and this is um, a, a method that uh, uh, is specific to single sample workflows. Uh, in the joint variant models, we were using both a mom, dad, and a child. This one is if you just have one. Um, it's useful for, you can see, for sh short tandem repeats, uh, the ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, for filtering those out, also for homopolymers, so just long streams or the poly A, as you can see there. Uh, it uses um, some pre-computed models. Those are some of the databases, uh, Syndip, the uh, genome of a bottle, and the platinum genomes, I think that's thousand genomes uh, model, or you can use your own. Um, and it's, it's designed to get at some of the more subtle issues um, in making calls. And you can see me there wearing one of those uh, fun t-shirts, the Chihuahua or Muffin t-shirt. And some of those pictures are pictures of Chihuahuas and others of them, others of them are actually pictures of muffins. And this is the tricky bit in neural networks is trying to figure out which one is a chihuahua and which one is a muffin. And so it goes with, with genomics. Um, I, I, in 60 seconds, uh, if, if neural networks are, are, are new to you, uh, I'll, I'll just throw up this very quickly um, in terms of how they're trained and how, how they're used. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, some inputs. And so this is input data. Uh, in the middle are weights, or this is the hidden part of the neural network. And on the out, uh, on the right is the, the output. And you start off with random weights in green in the middle. And basically you're trying to um, optimize some activation function here. And you can see it as the, the, this activation function is the sum of the inputs times the weights. And the weights are generally between zero and one. Uh, and you take that output in, in the back the so simple the back propagation method. Um, you you back propagate those uh, those numbers and you tweak them a little bit back into uh, into the weights, and you iterate on these uh, on these weights until you essentially maximize some kind of uh, activation function. Um, it, it, oftentimes, the easiest one to think of is just kind of a a sigmoidal function where uh, you're trying to decide when it is that you call uh, an output. You know, if, if the inputs are A and the letter B, um, you know, when do you set, decide that you've actually seen a letter A or a letter B? And in the very most simple form of a, a neural network, um, you go through this iterative, iterative process uh, to um, build these weights so that you get the output that is desired. Of course, the inputs are much larger. The number of weights are much larger. The number of hidden layers or number of weights in different um, sections can be much larger. Um, but that's the, the, kind of, the kind of base, you know, the, the basic uh, neural networks in 60 seconds. It gets to um, also back in chapter three, we talked about tensors uh, and how we represent information inside of um, these neural networks. It turns out to be very uh, computationally um, effective that if you're Inputs have multiple color channels or multiple filter channels. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, detecting edges, for example, you can consolidate all these things into to different parts of the tensor and indeed uh, use, uh, you know, tensor processing units or TPUs that are very specifically built for uh, managing these functions. Most of them are just these kind of mult adds where you're multiplying um, two, two things together and then adding them. And it's this thing that you're doing constantly over and over again that um, makes using these different um, specific processing types uh, or processor types uh, advantageous in neural network processing. 
So uh, so there's two models that are presented in the book. One is a a 1D convolutional neural network. Uh, Again, convolution just meaning um, we're rolling things together. Um, And uh, in this case, again, a lot of um, filters and, and multiplications and additions. The, uh, you have to change in the book. You have to change to the uh, the comp- convolutional neural network directory to make use of uh, of these commands. Um, I run, won't run them live, but I'll show you the output that I received after running them. And you can see that uh, we're scoring variants now based on this convolutional neural network. Uh, there's the reference, uh, the the VCF file that we're um, working against, and then of course the output. Um, there are some steps here. Uh, we're using uh, some inputs in in variant filtering. Uh, there's again the the uh, the sandbox that we're going to be putting out, the the scored from the previous step, and again some additional resources that help us um, with the, the the training set from the neural network. I've highlighted that we are using the 1D model for the neural network model, and again some best practices um, uh, parameters that uh, are are part of that process for making those calls. Some thresholds. Uh, here's the output of, of that, uh, that CNN, um, and you can see that, um, that there's the, again, in, in chromosome 20, uh, we're looking at just one sample right now. There's the name of the sample uh, and a couple of different um, positions. Uh, and this is uh, a candidate indel, in this case, an insertion that was filtered out by uh, the neural network model. And uh, you can see the, how it got there. And, and the most important thing is that it's, it's using the CNN model to, uh, to make that um, decision. So a way of giving you uh, additional um, input into uh, making those, those filtered calls. You can do the same thing in 2D. Uh, it has um, additional, uh, you know, additional filtering. Uh, the process is similar. Um, again, some different uh, uh, inputs to this. And um, again, we're using this idea, the tensor that we just talked about. And so um, multiple um, uh, dimensions that we're putting into, into this calling. And then uh, similarly, when you go through the filter, the, the important thing is you're using the, uh, the 2D call this time. And again, similar resources uh, that get us there. And the output is similar. Um, uh, you can see that uh, we've got uh, the same sample and uh, the, the, indeed the indel is still filtered out using uh, the, the 2D uh, convolutional neural network model. But the take home from this is uh, in this slide where uh, on the top track, you'll see the, the 1D model and the bottom is the, the 2D model. And it's a little difficult to see, but I put a black box around it. And um, this is a difference between uh, the, the two the models, the two models. And the, the, the reason that it's um, a little dimmer is that it's called differently between, uh, between those two models. So uh, can't really get into too much more detail about the differences between them other than they do exist and uh, it's all part of the secret sauce that uh, we're, we're learning about in in this chapter um, it's uh, probably the most complicated chapter in the book that we've had so far um, but it, it gives us a i think a, a reasonable uh, a reasonable starting point I, i've had a lot of fun over the last week um, playing with uh, these different tools and uh, amit and i have uh, 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 i've really enjoyed uh, walking through this together um, I, I added some additional resources here. Uh, so uh, Amit has mentioned uh, the, the Burroughs Wheeler Aligner, uh, BWA MEM. There's the classic paper um, about that, uh, a little bit more about haplotype color and uh, some of the background information. Uh, when you get into it, the, there's about a dozen different um, uh, best practices areas inside of um, GATK. The ones we were focusing on today were, again, the, the germline short variant, most specifically to the Illumina sequencers. And we covered both SNPs and indels. And those references there uh, take you to the documentation that's specific um, to this part that we're talking about. Uh, lastly, the part that I mentioned, the, the single sample, uh, there's some newer documentation. This gets into the warp uh, bits that we talked about in our last call. And so you'll see uh, both for a uh, whole genome on the top line and the whole exome, on the second line, uh, these are best practices and additional documentation um, for uh, for these areas. So uh, I'll stop sharing. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, we've got uh, a little a little bit of time here. Um, Amit, uh, I'll go back to you, and we'll take questions from uh, from from, uh, from our members.
Sure. Great. Well, let me start with one. Uh, you know, we were talking about the borough of Wheelers or Liner, and you said, uh, you know, you, your work with, you tried uh, MEM2, and it really didn't work for you. I'm, I'm just curious uh, if the work that you do, um, if you're thinking about moving to cloud, uh, it sounded like, you know, that's, that's an area that would make this more possible for you. Um, in the clinical environment that you're working in, I think a lot of our members are interested in how you use uh, these tools clinically. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your clinical workflow and then also how you think this might move into cloud someday so that you can take advantage of some of, the, some of these newer tools. Yeah, so uh, certainly I'm happy to share uh, my ex clinical ex experience. Uh, clinically, uh, we are working with targeted gene panels, uh, only about 100 or which includes only about 100 or so genes, which makes it possible to do analysis locally because it generate it doesn't generate as much data. Uh, and uh, also there are uh, HIPAA related concerns to put the data in the cloud or in the high performance computing environment. So that prevents us from moving to cloud. But nowadays, but the future of genomics lies in the cloud. So uh, eventually, even the clinical labs uh, are like clinical labs are slowly moving to high performance computing clusters and and the cloud. So eventually, even uh, we as a lab have to uh, uh, move to uh, the high performance computing environment. And the university provides uh, uh, the HIPAA aligned environment. It, they, they don't say that it's a HIPAA compliant, and that's where clinical clinicians really. Uh, get reluctant. They say HIPAA aligned and it, it's not HIPAA compliant. And what we look for is HIPAA compliant. So that really prevents uh, moving to high performance compute environments. But as we scale from uh, gene panels to uh, whole exomes, uh, in order to meet the computational needs as well as the storage needs, I, I, I believe. Uh, it will be inevitable for us to move to high performance, high performance computing clusters and, and to the cloud eventually. And yeah, and to do uh, to give a bit, bit of um, uh, overview of, so we are basically, we have our workflows running locally and uh, sometimes we use commercial tools, other times we use open source tools and these tools become part of the secondary and the tertiary analysis and they are all Installed locally, run locally, we, we maintain the documentation, we maintain the versions of the tools we are using. So uh, that's all done locally. Great, thank you. Well, let's pause for our members. Uh, I, I'm imagining that some of uh, some folks have had experience with uh, with germline processing with GATK. Others may have uh, just gone through the book for the first time and and try these exercises. Uh, any comments on on the experience of of going through this from from our group or questions in general about best practices with uh, with GATK? I've done this before, but uh, I think this would be this is the first time uh, in the cloud. I think that's that's all I can I can say. Well, I liked that the uh, the exercises were all kind of within the one to two minute run time so that uh, you could sit, you know, have a cup of a sip of coffee and come back and, uh, you know, you could still get some work, you know, you still move on to the next thing. So that was that was a nice change. I had just a thought because I uh, work in the clinical lab, like Sometimes it's difficult to find a cohort, and uh, again, uh, HIPAA doesn't uh, allow you to kind of work with a cohort of clinical uh, cases. So, and sometimes it's difficult to get samples from the same family. So you are sometimes bound to run uh, the single sample uh, workflow. So uh, I just wanted to see what the official uh, word is uh, about running the single samples at believe there are already there are workflows in place and I tried to refer those workflows in order to build the workflows but uh, 
how we can integrate uh, the trio analysis clinically. I guess that the area I really need to step up the game in. Yeah, I think it highlighted for me that there is a lot to learn about best practices, and uh, because it's 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 highly detailed. And uh, as you say, if you're using trio sequencing, it has the, the joint variant calling has a different process than for single, and you can approach it from different angles, right? So if you use the the CNN models, uh, a lot of this has to do with your. I mean, as I'm learning, um, your kind of computational goals and your research goals. Um, I think Adelaide had to drop, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask her that on Slack um, because I think this is an area where he, she has some uh, some previous experience. Well, uh, we'll we'll stop. We'll pause one more time for uh, questions from our group. Uh, this has been a, a again the, the we've, we've explored the secret sauce of GATK. Any final questions from our group before you uh, move on? Uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, you mentioned that you had a story uh, with regards to joint discovery, like when we, when we, when you were on the joint discovery slide, you had, you said you had like a, an experience that you was you were going to share in the Q&A section. So yeah. I was wondering if you... I, I wanted to get uh, Geraldine's thought on uh, some of the concerns I had about uh, how GATK would call variants in region in sample where there is no data. So you saw a slide where there was a sample where there was no data for clinically relevant variants. And, uh, and uh, from the book, it says that joint genotyping basically solves that problem because uh, it uses variant in one sample to make the call across all the samples. So what if one of the samples don't have data in it? Uh, yes, there will be a call made uh, based on uh, the data of all the other samples in the cohort, but how reliable will that call be in that region? Because that particular sample doesn't have any data. So I, I was just curious how GATK does that and how reliable those calls can be. Yeah, I think that we'll have a, a lively discussion uh, following up uh, on the GATK channel on, on Slack this week. Um, yeah. So that's the, the, the next, a good next step. Uh, speaking of Slack, um, I just wanted to point everyone back to the announced channel. Uh, recent conversations have been really interesting there, so I encourage you to take a look. Uh, also, um, we've had a lot of movement on uh, chapter coverage coming up for the rest of the book. So I wanna thank um, those of you who have signed up for upcoming chapters. Uh, I also wanna put out one last um, uh, wish list for next week, which is on somatic variant calling. If there's anyone that has experience with that, uh, that works in cancer, uh, that would like to pick up that chapter, let me know. Um, and we're, we've got a few more chapters that are open. Uh, you can take a look at Slack and see if uh, any of those would be of, of interest to you. Um, I think as Amit has, has shown uh, today, uh, picking up and presenting is, is a great way to learn material. And uh, Amit, again, thank you for joining us today and, and, and making that presentation. I really appreciate the hard work. Well done. Oh, that, that would be I learned a lot because I was not into joint genotyping. And now after learning so much, I really feel that uh, joint genotyping should, there should be ways to find, to integrate joint genotyping in, into clinical workspace. Uh, it really helps when you are uh, doing the, it, it will really help when you have the data from previous family members and uh, to, to really interpret the data and the variance. So, uh, in that context, it will be very helpful. Right. Very good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, though. <laughs> no, 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 no. Again, I really appreciate sharing that chapter with you. Uh, any last thoughts from our members? Well, otherwise, we'll we'll wrap this up and we'll pick up again next Monday. We're good. Okay, everybody. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next Monday when we talk about somatic mutation and uh, calling. Have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.